introduce James Waterman from the University of Liverpool that will tell us about docile transcendental entire functions. Please, James. Thank you very much, David. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about docile transcendental entire functions. Um, so just to give a brief outline of the talk. So I'll start with some basic definitions just to set notation um, and that sort of thing. Then um, the main uh, topic will be basically about local connectivity uh, of the Julia set um, in relation to these docile functions. So I'll begin with local connectivity of the Julia set um, for polynomials, and then talk a little bit about what this means uh, for transcendental entire functions. Um, and then I'll introduce uh, these two uh, subclasses of class B, so these two classes of transcendental entire functions that we have here, these geometrically finite ones and these docile functions. And then finally, I'll, I'll give an example, specifically an example of a docile function that isn't geometrically finite. Okay, so for our basic definitions, um, as usual, we're going to have f be analytic, and we're going to denote by f to the n the nth of f. And then the complex plane nicely splits up into the usual two set and the Julia set, which is a complement. So uh, we also have the escaping set, which we're going to denote by i of f. And these are the points on the complex plane for which the iterates tend to infinity. Um, so just for a polynomial, again, polynomial, uh, the escaping set is fairly nice, nice neighborhood of infinity. Um, it's in the two set and possibly important, most importantly for us, we have that the boundary of the escaping set is the J set. So um, if we have two polynomials, uh, P1 and P2, then basically I have, I have here two pictures for them, P1, P2, um, and white here is gonna be the escaping set and black are the points that don't escape. So Boch's theorem tells us that our maps P1 and P2 are gonna be conformally conjugate near infinity. So we have some nice neighborhood of infinity here. And again, a nice neighborhood of infinity over here. And we have some nice conformal conjugacy, like so, where phi is a conformal map. So uh, this is generally what we have for Butcher's theorem. And in fact, if we also have, which is the case for these two, uh, that we don't have any critical points escaping, then this conformal conjugacy that we have actually exists on the entire uh, basin of infinity. So all of the i of f or i of p1, p2. It's all of here. So um, the question then becomes is kind of what occurs on the boundary. So under what criteria could we say have a continuous extension of our conformal map to the boundary um, of the Julia set or the boundary which is of the um, uh, basin of infinity which is the Julia set. Um, and this is given uh, by the Carthidori Torhos theorem uh, for us. So um, now we're just going to restrict to the case where um, we have z to the d here, uh, or just uh, z squared if you want. And so um, in this case, the conformal isomorphism that we had before now is just the nice Riemann map that we get from the complement here all the way over here. And so then what the Carthidori uh, Torhos theorem tells us is that we get an extension to the boundary if and only if the boundary of our other basin over here is locally connected. And in particular for us, what this says is that um, if we have z to the d and the Julia set of our other map is locally connected, then our uh, conformal map extends to the boundary continuously. So um, this is nice and all, we have a nice uh, locally connected um, set. But in particular, what this tells us uh, is it allows us to understand, uh, of course, the dynamics um, of this map P2 over here as a quotient of what's happening for P1. So uh, the topological uh, dynamics of our map P2, whatever they are, for the drag map say, um, as just a quotient of this action uh, of angle delta, this C to the D. And so this is why local connectivity is so important for polynomials. It is the fact that you can basically describe um, what's in a sense a fairly complicated system as a quotient of this much more simple action, uh, just C to the D. So this is uh, the case for polynomials. Um, so now uh, we're going to move on to transcendental entire functions. So for transcendental entire functions, we again define the escaping set, which we again are going to denote by I of F. And again, it's the points uh, which iterate off to infinity. 
And now though, the escaping set is no longer a nice neighborhood of infinity. Uh, the escaping set can meet both the two set and the Julia set. And in fact, um, we have uh, these three properties um, which Aramenko showed. Um, in particular for us, I suppose, um, we have that the boundary of the escaping set is again the Julia set. And just to note that the closure of the escaping set has no bound components, uh, which leads to Aramenko's conjecture that all the components of the escaping set are in fact unbounded. And this is a major conjecture. Uh, yes. So um, a brief example of basically a picture for an escaping set of transcendental entire function that we'll get back to in a second is a quarter times the exponential function. Um, in white here is the two set. And then black here is basically the escaping set. So for Julia set. It's going to be basically what we have in black and white. Um, so this is the general picture for this nice map, quarter times the exponential function. So now what we're going to want to look at um, is local connectivity for transcendental entire functions specifically. Um, but in general, the Julia set of even a polynomial need not be locally connected. So for example, uh, if we have a cream point, um, then the polynomial won't be locally connected. Um, but even if we have a, a transcendental entire function, it, it's not um, often locally connected. So as a, um, a fairly simple, I guess, example, so the Julia set is not locally connected. For such messy functions as what we just saw a quarter times the exponential. So even for functions like this, where it's easy to write them down as a quarter times the exponential, it's not going to be locally connected. And in fact, basically as a general rule, as soon as we have an unbounded, the two component in the Julia set in general might be locally connected. Um, so even when the Julia set uh, is locally connected for a transcendental entire function, um, it being locally connected doesn't give us um, anywhere near as complete a description as what we had for the polynomial case before. So we don't get, um, so for example, we have that the Julia set of the exponential function is the entire complex plane, but, but we don't get anywhere near, we don't get like a really topological description of the dynamics just because of the fact um, that here, the uh, Julia set is the complex plane. We don't really learn anything too new. Um, so uh, which types of functions uh, can we look at for which having, um, for which we do get this sort of topological description uh, of the dynamics as basically um, represented as, um, well, in a sense, maybe a quotient, um, but basically you're describing the dynamics um, as part of a simple system. And in order to do this, we're going to look in the class B. So just to recall um, for the class B, we need to first look at the singular values of a transcendental entire function F. So the singular values are going to be the closure of the asymptotic values and the critical values. And just to recall, the asymptotic values are those values for which we have some curve that tends off to infinity and the function tends to some finite asymptotic value along it. So think like the exponential function has a finite asymptotic value uh, of zero. So once we have this, uh, we can introduce the Aramenko Vyubich class B. Um, so, uh, well, as written here, the Aramenko Vyubich class B is the class of transcendental entire functions for which the singular values are bounded. So, once we have this, what we have is the So uh, once we have this, we have all the senior values are nicely contained in some disk of radius r here, that's the senior values. And so what we can do is we can take the complement of this disk and look at the various preimages of this complement. And then what we get are unbounded, simply connected domains, since we're in class B, which these are going to be logarithmic tracks or just tracks for short. And on these tracks, on these logarithmic tracks, we have that the modulus of the function is equal to this value r here on the boundary. 
And in the interior, we have the modulus of the function it is greater than R. Um, and in particular, we also have that from each of these tracks onto the complement of this disk, we have a nice covering map. Um, and as an example, we have our favorite exponential function. And so for the, the um, logarithmic tract, the exponential function is a right half plane, which maps um, from the right half plane onto the complement of some disk. And we can see that the only single value that we have is nicely contained as zero inside the complement of, uh, or inside of this disk. Um, so that's the Amicus class B. Uh, next, we're going to want to introduce two other uh, uh, classes of, of functions, specifically uh, subclasses in the class B. Uh, the first are going to be maps of disjoint type. Um, so here we say a map is of disjoint type. If we have some domain here, D, so all the senior values are contained in D and the image of the closure is also contained in D. Um, so we can think of this in terms of the tracks that we just saw in particular. So we have some tract here, some uh, for us, an unbounded simply connected domain, and it's gonna map nicely onto the complement of some disk. And it's going to be a function in the class B is of disjoint type if this complement of the disk actually contains the tract. So this guy's going to be uh, of disjoint type, but a function for which you had that the tract intersected the image uh, disk, uh, it, or the image of the complement disk, um, is not going to be of uh, disjoint type. So this is basically what you can think of. And um, the, the nice um, feature of, um, the nice dynamical feature, I suppose, uh, of functions of disjoint type is that for these functions, the two set is connected. Um, so then finally, uh, before moving on to uh, these strongly geometrically finite functions, we need to introduce the concept of a function being post singularly bounded. So uh, as the name possibly implies, a function in the class B is post singularly bounded if the post singular set, which is this union, is bounded. Okay. So um, now we're in the position to talk about these strongly geometrically finite functions. Um, so for polynomials, um, having a finite orbit of critical points in the Julia set um, it is a generally important concept. And so this is um, basically a, an analog to this. Um, and so in particular, these finite, uh, these strongly geometrically finite functions are functions for which the two set intersected with the singular values is compact and the Julia set intersected with the post singular set is finite. And we also, um, want that the Julia set doesn't contain any asymptotic values and that we don't have uh, critical points of arbitrary large degree. So, so this is what we insist on. And so basically you can think of this as a, a class of functions in, in the class B, which ha have basically nice dynamical properties. And an next example to think of is the sign. So the sign map um, it is one of these strongly geometrically finite functions. And so in a recent paper uh, by Alamed, Rempa, uh, and Sixsmith, uh, they showed that basically using these properties of strongly geometrically finite functions, in fact, the Julia set, the, the entire Julia set of the sign map is locally connected. Um, so this is about strongly geometrically finite functions. And now we're going to talk a bit more about uh, this analog of, um, of basically Bach's theorem that we saw before. So for polynomials, remember from the beginning of the talk, we, we had this um, nice description uh, of the dynamics as this quotient. And we're going to want to look at basically what can be said or what class uh, of entire functions do we also have um, that this occurs. And so to begin with, in order to um, talk about this, what we first need to do is introduce the notion of quasi-conformal equivalence. So two maps, F and G here, are called quasi-conformal equivalent uh, if, well, there exists these quasi-conformal homeomorphisms 
um, VN psi such that we have um, this. And so basically, you can think of this as just this diagram here nicely. Should we see? And so we have F up here, G down here, and say F and so. So we have basically this diagram is what this definition basically means. And, and basically the thing to think about when you have this is say G of Z is F of lambda Z, the lambda Z. So um, this is what we'll basically be restricting ourselves to. And just really um, what you should probably be thinking about uh, when you think of two functions being quasi-formally equivalent. And note that if we have a function f uh, in the class B, uh, then we can always make a disjoint type function G by taking our lambda to be sufficiently small. So yes. Um, so in a sense, we can like get to a disjoint type function, um, which is quasi-conformally equivalent to our map. Okay, um, so now we can talk about um, the next result uh, of Rempa from 2009, which says um, that if we have two maps that are quasi-conformally equivalent, then what we have is a quasi-conform map, theta hat, um, which, well, so for right now, we have this theta hat, uh, which is on this map, uh, J greater than to R, one second. Yes, so it's on this map, J, uh, on this um, set, J greater than to R, which are these points in the Julia set, which always stay larger than some given value. So we have our Julia set here. And we look at all those points that always stay um, larger than this given R is um, what we have. So we have this quasi-conform map, or we have this uh, bijection on here, and we can extend it first off to a quasi-conform map on the entire complex plane for which we have this country C. Um, in particular, we can also um, extend it, uh, the, the bijection on this J grading to R to another map, uh, which is this map theta on the escaping sets. So a warning is that in general, um, the map theta here and the map theta hat aren't going to be the same. They, they are different uh, maps. Um, but this map theta on the escaping set this is basically going to serve as the analog of the real map that we saw before for polynomials. And um, we have now uh, this Riemann map theta, uh, which again is our analog, or we have this um, the analog of the Riemann map theta, of course. Um, and so now what we want is basically an analog of these simpler maps that we had for the polynomial case as z to the d with this angle doubling. And so this will take the form of these disjoint type functions. So a function of disjoint type in a sense play the role of the map z to the d that we saw the polynomials. Um, so this then leads to our definition, uh, which is uh, of a docile function. So um, these docile functions were first introduced uh, in this paper by Alan Medrempa and Sixsmith. And so basically, and these docile functions are like the case in, for polynomials that we have uh, our um, control map from base of infinity, which is the escaping set. And we want to say uh, that we have this continuous extension to the boundary. So if we do have this continuous extension, then we call the map docile. And we note that the image of infinity is again infinity. So the limit z tends to infinity of theta of should be z is again infinity. That's what this is saying. Um, but in particular, 
um, th there are still many functions, uh, e even simple to write down functions that are not docile. Um, for instance, the exponential function is definitely not docile um, as a warning. So, um, but there are many functions that are docile. In particular, Ahmed, Rempa, and Sixness show that all of those strongly geometrically finite functions uh, that appeared before are in fact docile. So we have a fairly large class of nice functions in the class B that are in fact docile. Um, and so now uh, what we'll want to do is give various properties of uh, these docile functions for which we have uh, this basically extension, continuous extension to the Julia set. Um, and the first one uh, we'll have as, um, yes. So the first one will be uh, if we have a function f and it is docile, um, then as you might hope, any iterate f to the n is also going to be docile. And so just to give you a very vague idea, um, so in constructing the map theta that we have uh, here, or well before, uh, what we do is basically you look at the different tracks of uh, so you look at the tracks of say, uh, you have two maps here, some disjoint type uh, function G and some F that are quasi-conformally equivalent. And what you can do is you can basically look at the tracks of G, G2, G3, and so on, and compare them to the tracks um, for F. And so basically this is how you build your map theta that you have for each of these different tracks, you have a quasi-conformal or you, you have well, a bijection between these maps um, and you want various properties to have it converge. And so if you have this, uh, then you can basically uh, apply this general idea to both F and F to the N to get this. Uh, so this is um, for F and F to the N. And now the main result is that um, if we have uh, F as a postingly bounded docile function, um, so uh, we have this basically uh, analog of this extension to the boundary, then in fact, um, those uh, sets in the Julia set, which are compact, connected, and forward invariant are in fact locally connected. So, so we again see that basically, uh, once we, we, we see that there's this connection between ha having this uh, um, continuous extension of the, the Riemann map, um, or at least the analog of it, uh, um, having this connection between that and some compact forward invariant sets being locally connected. So the thing, uh, the thing to think about here is basically um, polynomial-like maps. Um, is one of the things to think about. And so here one can see this is a, a map that's basically in a sign family. It's basically sign. Z plus A minus sine A over cosine A, something like this. And so here um, one can see that basically we'll have on the boundary these compact forward invariant sets. And so what this result says is that here these sets are going to be locally connected. Even though, so we're not worried about what's happening in the Julia set away from here. We're not worried out here. We're just worried about. Um, so the Julia set in general um, may or may not be uh, globally locally connected. However, here, these compact forward invariant sets will be for both um, this guy here and say this guy, which looks like the rabbit on the right. Um, so yes, and as a very rough idea of the proof, basically we have our map F and RK, uh, which is this compact uh, connected forward invariant set. And we have then, um, uh, because of the fact that we're assuming it's docile, we have our map theta, which takes it um, to a disjoint type map over here, say G, which is F lambda Z. And with this, what we can do is we can look at all the points in K, uh, where they're basically bounded addresses, so all these points that land, say at K, 
And we can use the docility to compare these with this joint type uh, map, this joint type case. And then we can use basically the topological properties um, as well as uh, the order of these bounded addresses in order to get local connectivity for our map K, for our, not for the map K, for the set K. Okay, so there's that result. And so next and finally, um, uh, we have uh, that there exists a transcendental entire function that is not strongly geometrically finite um, because of the fact that it has an indirect asymptotic value, but we show that it is in fact a docile function. Um, so the function in question was first studied by Bergweiler, uh, in particular because the two set here uh, he shows that it's a completely invariant component. Um, but because of the fact that we have this indirect asymptotic value, uh, it is a um, it is uh, not one of these strongly geometrically finite uh, functions, but one can basically uh, construct some sort of expanding metric um, on the Julia set in order to get uh, that it is in order to show that it is in fact a Gosa function. Um, so just to reiterate basically that we have, uh, while we have many of these functions uh, that are strongly geometrically finite that are docile, um, in general, we have a significantly larger class that are also docile, but not uh, strongly geometrically finite. That's all, thank you very much for your attention.